All right, a little weird now to kick us off here. So, does anybody have any questions before we start? I just sent out an email about the midterm, so I'm going to be putting in your midterm grade where you are, but you can calculate your current grade anytime. So, I put in a little formula on that. So, check your email box if you're wondering how to do that for current grades, or always you're welcome to come see me about it as well. Um, any questions, sir? Two more days of regular class. Then we got Wednesday, remember, is the next thing. So Wednesday's our, our test. So all right. We left off talking about in general what we call market failure. I've always kind of hated that word because in many cases I don't think the market really gets an F. Market failure, let's put that in quotes. So the idea of market failure is that normally the market, the free market system is like an A student, man. Just, it just gets straight A's all the time, works efficiently to allocate scarce resources uh, to their highest and best use. But every once in a while, the market goes out drinking, and, and uh, the next day on the quiz doesn't do so well. So every once in a while, the market gets maybe a, you know, a C or a D and you know, doesn't, doesn't perform so hot. And so, but still doesn't get an F overall for the course, but rather just gets maybe a couple, couple marks that, that knock it down. So the idea of market failure is, a situation where the uh, free market fails to provide the allocatively efficient quantity. So when we did chapter three and we talked about competition and all of that, we looked at how Supply equals demand, that quantity that gets exchanged is allocatively efficient for, for uh, society, which is a, is a good thing. That, that's one of our meters that we use to measure the market. And so now what we've seen in the, both the public good space as well as the externality space is that it doesn't always do that. So why? Why does this happen? So number one is a lack of information. A lack of information for either the buyer or the seller. So this is one reason that the market may fail to provide the efficient quantity for us is if there's a lack of information. Um, so one thing that has come along that is a good government regulation, for the most part, I think, is food labels. So if you have a peanut allergy, Chances are you want to avoid items that have peanuts. So the little label that comes on here was not by choice of Starbucks, right? This little thing here. They may have done it on their own, but the government chose to impose a regulation that said all food labels must be standardized, right? So notice when you look at a food label, calories up top, fat, cholesterol, blah, 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 all the stuff is in a format so that the consumer can quickly look at the Starbucks brand versus the other brand versus the other brand and can see the ingredients that are in there and make a wise decision. Because from an economist perspective, if you're buying something with peanuts and you have a peanut allergy and you didn't learn that until you went home and you started to swell up, that was inefficient, right? 
We don't, we don't know. Usually it just sucks. We think, oh, it's a health-related problem, whatever. But from an economist perspective, that sounds like a problem with the marketplace that might have a fairly easy solution. And the provision forcing a company to provide that information in this particular context is pretty cheap for them, right? They're already printing out the, their logo on the can. So for them to carve out whatever that, what do you think that makes up, Nolan, of the whole can? Is that 10% of the can space maybe? Maybe a little bit more? 10 to 15% of the can space has to be reserved for revealing the product information, right? So from, again, from a cost-benefit analysis, the benefit of having that regulation on the books seems to far exceed the cost to the company. It's not overly burdensome for the company, right? So that's a, that's a marginal benefit, marginal cost. Econ economists, since the dawn of time, have been, uh, or at least Adam Smith, because that's who kind of started it all, when it comes to governmental decisions for public goods or public issues, like what we've been talking about, we'd like them to do a cost-benefit analysis. Because what we learned in the public goods sector or chapter last week was that politicians tend to focus on the benefits because it's an easy political ploy, right? So they tend to look at the benefit side, not the cost. So last night, Bernie Sanders and, and I think most of the Democratic crowd, I, I watched uh, part of that debate, they again, once again, brought up the living wage. Let's change the minimum wage to $15. Woohoo! Fanfare, right? That sounds great. Everybody should make 15 So we're focusing in on the benefits of that policy, while nobody mentioned the economic cost of doing that, that some, some people are going to lose their jobs, blah, 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 right? So politicians, because they're out for getting um, votes, are going to focus more on the, on the benefit side. So the key thing that we uh, economists look for here for efficiency on the buyer and the seller is that the playing field's been equalized with information. The buyer and the seller have equal amounts of information, then we have probably an efficient outcome. In other words, the the particular good might have risk with it. So there's a famous case with the Ford Pinto. Um, it was an old car that had a gas tank that was blowing up. The gas tank was located close to the back bumper. And sure enough, there was a bunch of accidents. People were dying and, and or getting injured. And it turned out that uh, Ford could have fixed the problem for $13 a car. But they didn't disclose that originally. So now you start doing the cost-benefit analysis, and you're thinking, oh, well, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't sound so bad. But uh, that they should have done it, and that they're bad guys or whatever. But the economists might look at that and say, no, 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 no. That the, the bad part is, is that they didn't reveal the information as soon as it became available. Because let's just say that it was a 0 .0005 chance of you getting involved in a rear-end collision and, and dying from the car. As long as you know that prior to buying the car, you have an efficient solution, right? It doesn't matter, as long as that's been factored into the price. So the price of the car, yes, after the fact, wouldn't have gone up by much. You know, who cares if you're buying a, at that time, I don't know if it was a, probably an $8,000 car or something, but $8,000 plus a $13 fix or whatever, right, is no big deal. So as a consumer, we probably would have still bought the car anyway if we liked it. But the difference is we would have known about the risk we were taking. So that's what this lack of information uh, addresses, is that ideally, ideally, uh, all parties to the transaction, all parties have equal information. at least what's knowable information. And that, that leads us to a more efficient outcome. So some of these market failures might have to do with that. Uh, the government passed stuff like lemon laws 
if you buy a car, there's an automatic 30-day warranty. Basically, if you buy it from a used car, not from a for sale by owner, but if you buy it from a car dealer, then and the, you drive it off the lot, and a week later something happens to it, you can bring it back to them, and they either have to refund your money or repair it. So there's kind of a warranty that was called lemon laws because the presumption was that the car dealer knew about the defect. They knew about the defect but didn't reveal it to you. And so you got screwed. And so as long as we know about the defect, then, then we can um, negotiate on price. Like maybe that defect was like a, a whatever, $300 fix or something. Well, you're asking 3000 I know that thing has to be fixed. I'll, I'll give you 2700 right? We just kind of factor that into the price, and the price equalizes the issue. But you can't do that if you don't have information about what that defect is. Ideally, all parties have equal information. Ideally, all parties have equal information. And so that's what leads to possibly the government having a law like food labels to force that information to be revealed. <laughs> OK. So number two, in general, just to kind of make a complete list, was public goods. Remember, we didn't have uh, uh, the allocatively efficient solution come out to us. So the market fails to provide the efficient level if goods are non-rival and non-excludable, we might not get to the optimal provision of the good. And then this chapter, externalities. So what was an externality again? Should have it in your notes. Cost or benefit borne by a third party good. Not directly related to the transaction, yeah. So the whole third party, it, it kind of just reinforces that. But what does it mean to be a third party? You weren't the buyer or the seller. You just got uh, influenced by it. All right, so um, the last thing, that was just to kind of tee things up for today. Um, we had the COD. I want to follow up a little bit more with the COD example. So we have overfishing. This was referred to as, or is referred to as, the tragedy of the commons. It's kind of the famous thing. It originally came from us, uh, from England, back kind of pre-industrial revolution farming time, where nobody actually owned the land, and it was possible for your sheep or your cattle to just kind of roam anywhere, and then there was overgrazing. And so the commons were owned by everybody. Nobody has the rights to the land. We all share it equally. And then that turned into problems. And so one of the solutions to the tragedy of the commons um, was to have people own it, which is a topic we'll talk about here in a little bit. So the cod example, though, we had um, overfishing. Overfishing. And what we didn't draw out last time, I showed you some data, was to think about the market for cod. So we're measuring the quantity of cod there. Again, we have a upward sloping marginal cost curve with fishermen and a downward sloping marginal benefit curve which is the demand curve. Notice today I, I didn't put the demand and supply there. I just thought I'd put marginal cost and marginal benefit of cod production. And this is really the buyers of the fish. This is the sellers of the fish, the fishermen. And with overfishing, we end up leading to additional societal costs, right? There's actually costs being borne um, to everyone that are higher than what the private cost was. So similar to our, our uh, example with pollution, society's cost is higher than the cost to the fishermen. 
the fishermen go about maximizing profits by producing this quantity. So let's call it QM for market, just the market quantity, supply equals demand. However, the society's benefit is where the marginal social cost curve intersects the marginal social benefit curve, which by default is equal to the private benefit curve, if nothing else is said, if there's not any external benefits to the problem. Our issue here now deals with the cost of depleting the stock of fish. So the overfishing part happens by thinking about society's cost and society's benefit, which gives us the allocatively efficient quantity right there, somewhere to the left of where the market is, which is giving us our overfishing result graphically. So cod is being overfished because of um, there being too much of it. Nobody owns the fish. All right, so what are some ways that the government goes about controlling overfishing? What do we do? Limits, yes. So one thing that we do is impose limits. So um, do I have any bass fishermen in here? How, what's the limit on bass in whatever state you're from? If you're in Kansas, do you guys know what the bass limit is? On Sometimes it varies by lake, but. It varies by the size of the Well, that's a different thing, a size limit. So there's quantity limit is two at most places that I've, that I've seen. I might be thinking of Iowa laws, but I believe it's two, two largemouth bass. And each of those has to be at least 18 inches long or, or longer. So, and it might be, maybe it's 16. It might be 16, yeah. So it might even be 15 in Iowa, but anyway, 15 or 16 inches long. Certain lakes that are really popular lakes, they might increase it to 18 is what I think I might be picking up. So they can impose different regulations. So there can be size and quantity uh, regulations. Also, what does the state require if you want to go fishing? A license. So you got to go buy a license to fish, um, which then collects some money for them to raise uh, funds for the DNR and to monitor fish populations and all that. I had a good friend of mine, that a buddy that I played softball with and drank a lot of beer with. Um, he worked for the DNR, so I got kind of the inside track. He got like his dream job. He's a, he fishes for a living basically with the DNR. And one of the things they do is they shock the lake. So they literally put in an electrode into the lake and they shock it. All the fish come floating up. They're not dead, but they come floating up. They're kind of stunned. And they gather the fish and they count them. And that's how we start to get uh, fish populations uh, figured out. Uh, within a lake is they'll randomly select and, and count the fish basically in the lake. And that way they can monitor should we change the limits? Should we change the sizes? That sort of thing. Okay, so that's just a little, a little bit of, of some of the techniques that, that we do. So um, by having a limit, we call that a quota. So possible solutions. Possible solutions. Number one, a quota. Right, a quota is a limit on the quantity. So number two is requiring a license, right, which gives you authority to fish. So we got kind of two things going on there. You, we can authorize people to fish, and then we can set limits on the quantity according to, to what we do. And so with here, uh, a simple way to think about it is that the correct quota amount, if, if my buddy Jeff Popaska can, uh, can count these fish when they're stunned, 
is that they've learned through biology, that stuff that I don't understand very well, of, of how many fish can repopulate a lake and kind of what the optimal level of the fishing would be, right? So if we set the quota amount to be QAE, then we might be in business, right? We just simply restrict the, restrict the quantity out there. All right, so um, there's uh, issues with that. We don't think about this too much in, in Kansas or with local fishing lakes, but if, if anybody can get a license and everybody can have two fish per license on a given day, are we really able to control for sure how many fish are being harvested? Not really, right? It's, it's a little bit more difficult. Now, when we go fishing in Kansas for largemouth bass, it's probably more of a recreational purpose, right? What about ocean fish? Is that more recreational or commercial? Commercial. Now we're into restaurants and we're having large quantities, right? So if we have a market price for fish and we have this system, even doing a license and a quota, we very well still might be overfishing it. As long as the price of tuna is high enough for sushi or something, right, we're going to have incentives out there for people to go out and fish. So a response to that, a response to that is kind of a hybrid of the two, and it's called an individual transferable quota, an ITQ. An individual transferable quota. So with this, we're going to max out both things. So we're really going to we're going to um, authorize individuals. for uh, specific quantity. But we're going to limit the number of licenses as well. There's a limit on the license. so that we can better control the populations, especially with commercial fishing. If you guys have seen some fishing shows, even if you're not a fisherman, it's kind of fascinating what they, what's been developed over time with fishing. Like for some of those tuna, they will let out uh, 500 to 1,000 feet of fishing line with individual hooks every so often. I can't remember. It would be like, it seemed like every two feet. And there would be... A thousand feet worth of line that that a ship is dragging and if they get into a school of fish they can pull in a whole bunch of tuna at one time and then after they drag it through they haul them in and it's unhook 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 and they might pull in 500 to a thousand fish all in one cast if you will all in one shot and then of course there's netting techniques and other things so it's big business and, and um, there's there's fish out there especially special kinds of tuna that go for sushi that that can be very expensive and so it's it's um, profitable for them to figure out how to do it so how do we divvy these out how do we divvy these out let's say that we're imposing this new policy there's never been a rule before we've got hundreds of fishermen commercial people out there how do we divvy up the, the licenses. Okay, so we could do a randomized drawing technique. A randomized drawing technique. So let's put on here who gets it. Who gets it. Maybe through a lottery system. A lottery draw. Now, from an economist's perspective, 
if there's a hundred people that potentially want the license, okay, and we're only going to give out 50 of them, what's a potential problem for society in terms of cost, perhaps, using the lottery system? Kind of bigger picture, stepping back, the lucky, whoever's lucky gets them, but from an economist perspective, how might that, how might that not be efficient? Uh, what do you mean by charge more? For the fish? So let's go back to a kind of a perfectly competitive model, which actually this would probably follow, is that the market price of tuna or whatever it is would really be determined by thousands of, of buyers. So basically it's $5 a pound or it's $6, you know, whatever whatever it is it is, is kind of the market price. But good, good thing to bring up. Dirt? Uh, the, the people that get the licenses might not be necessarily the most efficient or yeah, yeah. So from an economist perspective, it might kind of suck if 50 out of 100 and it turns out all the losers got it, right? All the people that are really kind of bad fishermen, which means from that, from a cost perspective, they're probably the high cost fishermen. So imagine that there's really good fishermen that can do it at a lower cost. What does a lower cost mean? They go out, catch 100 fish with two guys. Uh, a high cost fisherman goes out with three guys and catches maybe the same hundred fish. But the one group did it with three guys, the other group did it with two guys, right? Would be one example. Or just the sheer quantity. So if we think about the productivity of our workers, uh, we've got kind of the suck fishermen and the good fishermen. If I was God looking down at society and I needed to figure out who's the best person to fish, I'm going to take one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to 50, always picking the low cost fishermen, right? Let's put the Michael Jordans, the Le LeBron James of fishing out on the ocean. From a use of society's resources, that would be the best thing, right? We want to, we want to have the most highly skilled, best people put into that position. The lottery kind of fails to do that for us, potentially. Okay, why? That lottery system allows for both good and bad fishermen out there, which also allows the actual tuna population to continue to grow over time. Well, they've already done the, the tuna growing thing with the quota. So they've already, they've already fixed that problem. So now I'm working on the cost problem, is, is that we'd, we'd ideally like to get the best fishermen out there. Okay, so where does that get addressed? What does this part mean? What does the T mean in the ITQ? They can sell it. All right, so now, who's going to sell and who's going to buy the right to fish? The worst sellers are going to sell it to the best that got screwed, right? And so, yes, in a sense, they still won the lottery and they want some money, but if they can make more money selling because they suck at fishing anyway. If they can make more money selling the permit to the good fishermen, and assuming they're a profit maximizer, right, they're gonna do that. And so this ends up being the real secret sauce to the, to the whole policy prescription, is having things transferable. The fact that you can sell the permit allows us to get a different result over here. The value on average for the value of the permit is going to be this vertical height right here, which is the amount of the external cost. So the external cost on average, this will be the average value. This is the price of the ITQ. So it's the permit that's now going to be traded. How was this facilitated? It was facilitated by government, right? Because we had an open fishery, we had to impose some rules with quotas. But by doing this part, over the long haul through trade again, we're going to see the Michael Jordans and LeBron James of fishing getting the permits ultimately. Because they're going to find it profitable because their costs are so much lower, they can afford to pay the loser's amount who aren't going to make that anyway, right? So we've really set up a market 
for something that didn't have a market before through the establishment of property rights. So the property rights being established was a key feature and then the transferability of those rights was the next part of the secret sauce. All right, so questions or comments there? Yes. Uh, possibly, yeah, not, not necessarily with everything. I, I guess I don't know what everything is. Like, if it, Right, right. So one of the things that makes this work is the commercial viability of it, that there's a market price. Because if you're doing it for recreation, you're just doing it for fun anyway. Well, it's like I can't buy your fun or, well, you can do that. I shouldn't say that too yeah, quickly. Yeah, I mean, the way they have the mod set up, you're not always going to see the dealer. That's right. And the, yeah, so they're playing a little bit of a different technique there the, with, with how many they get. Yeah. So part of what makes this work is that uh, it's likely that the fishermen are going to be able to bump up to the quota amount every time because there's, there's plenty of fish out there. So the, uh, the picture we had last time, remember, don't forget, where we had the amount of fish in the bucket. And what we're going to do is have the biologist monitor the birth and death rate of fish. Death was also harvest. So this gives us a mechanism to slow down the, the death rate, if need be, to keep the level of the bucket at the optimal sustainable level, whatever that is, according to the uh, marine biologists. Okay, now, this same technique was also used for pollution. So we brought up some pollution examples um, when we first approached it, and we said that one idea was to what did we do? You tell me what was the what was the thing that the first suggestion we had for uh, potentially solving the market failure? What was that? The tax. That's right. So with pollution, we had the tax, but what if we did something called cap and trade? Has anybody heard of cap and trade? Might have heard it in the news here, even within the, well, within your lifetimes for sure, but even in the last year or so, they, uh, during each political campaign, it ends up being a possibility. Cap and trade, and so imagine that we've got an industry of uh, polluting carbon monoxide. And we have, let's say, uh, hundreds of companies currently polluting. And if we looked at a, a little graph here, where we're measuring time, we haven't done this very often, if at all. We've done it in a, maybe some other stuff, but time on the horizontal axis, and pollution up here, some sort of measure of the levels of carbon monoxide parts per thousand uh, again, stuff I don't understand, yeah. right? We got some sort of measure. Parts per million, thank you. Okay, so we look at that and it's kind of alarming because in 1950, it looked like this and now it's looking like this, right? And so here we are in, in 2000, maybe I'll even put it over here, 2015. And we're not dead yet, right? We're not breathing in too many parts per million so that we're going to just go take a breath and croak. But the trajectory is kind of scary. By the time we, re you know, somebody who studies this stuff comes out and says, by the time we hit 2050, you know, well, this is, this is big trouble if we continue on this path. So why do we have a problem? 
it's expensive for firms to pollute. So again, possible solutions. Possible solutions. We could just regulate and say, uh, businesses, sorry, you can only emit, let's say they were on average doing a, a million parts per million, and now they say you can only do 500,000 parts per million, right? So possible solutions, one, government regulation, to uh, cut uh, pollution by 50%. So to the existing companies right now, these hundreds of companies that are producing that, what do you think kind of impact that has on the bottom line for them for 2015-2016? Is that easy? They kind of like food labels, pretty cost free, they just put them on? No, it's huge, right? So they have these things called scrubbers. And I, here's, my, here's my picture of a, of a scrubber. So we've got this manufacturing plant, and then we've got all these polluters. I need to make this bigger. So we've got a manufacturing plant with a big old smokestack, right, coming out. And ooh, here's all the ooey stuff that's – maybe I do uh, – how do you do a colon crossbones here? Big dark eyes and a smiley face, right? So we have death being emitted into the atmosphere, right? Well, it turns out, uh, through the use of innovation and technology, there's these scrubbers. Now, what I imagine is that there's a little dude up here that we create a job for, and he's got a little broom, and he's just scrubbing the inside of the, kind of like a chimney sweep from, from uh, Fiddler on the Roof or something, and he's just scrubbing, scrubbing, scrubbing. Uh, turns out, I don't think it really works that way, but it's kind of fun to think about. And the companies could put in these scrubbers, but they're really, really expensive. And another thing that they could do is they could um, put in a brand new plant that has a brand new machine that some engineer came up with that doesn't pollute as much as the previous machine, right? It, the machine that's doing the current million parts per million is something that they put in place in 1968 and they're still using it, right? It still works fine, they've just been kind of fixing it as they go, so it's not the new machine. But again, the new machine might be a, a $5 million investment. All right, so this might put people out of business, <clears throat> might put firms out of business. For all intents and purposes, that might not be really viable. So, another solution would be to cap the amount of pollution that's currently going on. They're going to say, okay, hundreds of companies, we're going to allow you to keep doing what you're doing today. Whatever that level is, you are now capped. So if your company wants to grow, you're going to have to do it differently. You're going to have to do it with cleaner technology or a new, new building or something. In other words, we're going to pass a law that effectively makes all pollution levels freeze at 2015 levels. We're going to put in a cap on that. So each one ends up getting issued a permit to pollute. So issue a voucher or a permit, maybe I don't even want to use the word voucher, I might confuse this with something else we're going to talk about. Issue a permit to pollute at current levels. Issue a permit to pollute at current levels. Their way, that way, in theory, none of these guys go out of business because they can't afford it. They can keep operating their own machines and whatnot. Now, what does this part mean? They can sell those permits. Kind of similar to our ind individual transferable quota, they can sell these permits. 
And this is probably one of the neatest things that I saw in my time frame. This was back in the 80s when some economists brought this solution to the table. And since then, these permits have been sold on the Chicago Board of Trade. Remember my little Chicago Board of Trade shirt that I wore during our big trade day? Uh, that, that commodity, which is just pollution permits. In other words, you can buy pollution. They are openly traded at the Chicago Board of Trade uh, at any time for anyone to buy, right? Who's going to buy? Who's going to sell? Well, now the firms have a different type of incentive, don't they? Because they might have to bite the bullet on a brand new building, but in doing so, they freed up some of their pollution permits that can now be sold on the Chicago Board of Trade. So now they can sell the right to permit or to pollute, which allows a dirty firm, so let's think of a clean firm and a dirty firm, not dirty in a bad sense, but just dirty in the sense that they have chosen to continue to use the existing technology. The dirty firm now can expand their operations. They can go above a million parts per million and they can add on, they can ramp up production, whatever they need to do in a dirty way and a legal way because they bought the permit from another firm that chose to sell them. All the while from society's perspective, pollution stayed capped. So cap and trade is another market-based solution that might be available to governments or society to use rather than just immediately going to a tax or some other policy. So these are kind of creative solutions that use the discipline that a market brings in terms of pricing and efficiency. Again, the low cost, the high cost, like we saw with the cod, the, the LeBron fishermen and the, and the sucky fishermen. I gotta come up with a non-fisherman. Who's a basketball player in here? No offense. I just know that you're not a LeBron because LeBron's like a once in a lifetime. Who's basketball? You guys are basketball, right? So Kyle, we got the Kyle Fisherman and the LeBron Fisherman. Again, no offense, but you know you're not LeBron James, right? All right. So we got we got we got Kyle being able to sell sell something to LeBron so that we're reallocating society's resources, keeping LeBron out to sea. Over here, we've presumably fixed the problem. Again, assuming research says that there is a problem, blah, blah, blah. So let's just take that as given that we think pollution is an issue at this level. We cap it. We allow to trade. And now the trading aspect allows us to get clean firms and dirty firms the right incentive to clean up. And eventually, we'll start to have uh, higher and higher levels of production of whatever they were producing, whether it was electricity or something else. But we'll have the greener ones doing the majority of it. And the dirty ones will start to get fractionally less and less and less as time goes on. Could, this is probably appropriate for us to just thought, could the government use this concept to reduce pollution? Like, let's say that mm -hmm. a dirty company puts their vouchers up, could like the EPA go in and buy those? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, so that's my question. Better yet than the EPA, it also allows um, Greenpeace to buy them. Anybody can buy them. So if you think the world is ending because of pollution, put your money where your mouth is. You can go buy, and by the way, people have done this. You can go take pollution off the market. So by the way, it's really expensive though. So each one of these permits can run like a million dollars uh, for each one. So the firms are spending like, you know, multi-millions for the right to pollute. But if Greenpeace buys it and they take pollution off the market because they're just sitting on them and they framed them on their wall in the Greenpeace headquarters, they've got a big thing that says Chicago Board of Trade purchased, bought, and sold a million dollars worth of permits, you've effectively reduced the cap down, right? So you've lowered pollution that way. Um, where, where I first went with your, with your question, Dirk, was um, is it possible to set it up staggered over time? And the answer to that is yes, too. So let's say this is a dangerous level already for some reason, right. but we don't want to put firms out of business in year one by just passing a law. We can say that the permits are going to be reduced over time and bring it down over time somehow, but still allowing the transferability because then 
Some firms might, well, next year we're going to do the plant modification and then we can trade. That'll all obviously alter the value of the permit though, right? So if you have the right to pollute, the price of that permit's going to fall if we've now reduced the future benefits of it because you're not going to be able to pollute as much with that single permit later. Factory doesn't like startup factory doesn't buy right off the well, yes, they do. So the question was, does a startup factory have to go out and buy them? It's kind of a loaded answer, but the answer is yes, if they're going to be polluting. But if there's a new technology available, since they're a startup company anyway, they would just buy the green production oh, method, right? right. I mean, do they get issued for that? No, nope, they wouldn't get issued anything. Yeah. They would be just existing, and then the, the new firms would come up as technology caught up with it, we'd have another alternative way to make this that doesn't pollute or something at the $500,000 level, and then they'd be in. So they're having when new technology comes out, they Is that the game one? Yeah. Um, we, we, usually with pollution, there's an acceptable amount of pollution Mother Nature can digest, right? If you go take a crap in the river, one single person, have you ruined the environment? No. Now, if we dump all of the sewage, everybody who took a crap today, in Ottawa into the river, would we probably cause an environmental issue? Yes, right? So my point with that is that don't forget with pollution that more is not always better. It's pot Mother Nature can absorb a certain amount. It's kind of like our cod fishing. A certain amount of fishing is sustainable because the fish had the birth rate, death rate thing, right? So Mother Nature renews itself. As long as we don't push it to the nth degree, then there's a certain amount of pollution that is acceptable or that can be tolerated um, because of the sustainable nature of the environment. Okay, good questions. Anything else? All right, so that is cap and trade. So issue permits. Uh, at the uh, current levels, and then let me write down the, the rest of that, what we said. <coughs> so then allow companies, number two is allow companies to trade those rights. So number, well, so this is actually just under number two still. Allow companies, and let me just put green companies since we're dealing with pollution. Allow green, let's put greener companies to sell permits to Dirty companies. So the conclusion here is that with both, and these are real world examples, by the way, I'm not just, this isn't just theory. Now we're actually applying some economics. We spent a lot of time in the semester thinking perfect competition, theoretical example, blah, blah, blah. This is real life economics affecting the world here. With both cod and carbon monoxide, uh, market solutions with some, in fact, let's just call it little, little government intervention led to a more efficient outcome. Matt, did you have a hand up? Yeah. Um, are these permits like renewable by the year? Is that how they do it? Yeah. Yeah. So they, with the cap and trade concept. Uh, basically, they have the right to keep polluting at that level for you know an indefinite time frame is one way that it's handled. So you've got the right; it's a kind of a renewable contract of X amount, and then you're able to 
sell X amount. I think there's minimums on what you can sell. Like it has to be in certain, like, again, I'm just making up numbers here, but 500,000 block increments of parts per million or something like that. So it's, the market is a little bit chunky in the sense that you can't just sell off. Uh, I think I'll, I need a little money today. I'll just sell off one part per million. You know, you can't just go to the Chicago board of trade and sell one of them. Okay. So how about the benefit side is uh, the other part I wanted to hit at this point. Um, let's put market solutions with uh, external benefits, question mark. So with the COD and the, um, the COD and the pollution, we're talking negative externalities, but what about with external benefits. So the one I want to take another look at, another stab at, is education. So we did this picture before. We had education measured somehow along the horizontal axis and dollars here reflected in marginal benefits and the social benefits were higher than the private benefits because smart people tend to steal less stuff than dumb people and smart people tend to create creative things that make our lives better and innovate and so society ends up getting some extra benefits from you sitting in your chairs for education. And so the marginal social cost curve, presuming there's no pollution going on at Ottawa University or some of these schools with a big smokestack that needs a scrubber, right? The social costs are reflected in the private costs. So those two things are one and the same. So society's allocatively efficient quantity is greater than where we're seeing in the private free market. And that's our market failure. All right. Um, where's my other? Do a single exhaust and fuel. Undo these here to get some stuff going. So the solution we talked about last time was a subsidy. So let's just give people some money. As we learned in chapter six, it actually didn't matter if we gave OU some money or if we gave you some money. So whether it goes to OU or you, one idea was to give a subsidy equal to the external benefit. And you guys have this in your notes from last time, so I might not put all the details in, but this vertical height here, the private benefit to you, the private benefit to you is here, and so you're willing to pay something for OU education, but for crying out loud, there's no way you're ever going to pay that much, right? So the expense to you, what we call the PC, remember from chapter six, the price that the consumer pays with the subsidy is down here. So there's the student's pay after we impose the subsidy. We give some money and then we end up have, hopefully having QS equal to QAE. So our one approach so possible solutions to the problem by the way your textbook does a really nice job of laying this all out so make sure you get on your reading as, as soon as possible for the chapter possible solutions number one 
is a subsidy equal to the external benefit. This is again kind of a repeat of what we just did. And then I'm just going to put but dot dot dot. We talked about a but last time. So you can look back in your notes for that. The but was can we really measure the benefits well? Do we have when we have subsidies going in, is all of that money being spent efficiently? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Number two, we did not talk about, but Bernie Sanders did last night. Did anybody watch the Democratic debate? No. A little bit. What did Bernie Sanders, you might have heard this from, from other things. What did Bernie Sanders say about college tuition? What did he want to see you guys pay? Nothing. Woo! Free tuition! Who's going to vote for Bernie Sanders now? Yay! Right? Hopefully after taking this class, you're going to say, Bernie, how the heck are you paying for that? And then he comes up with some, we're going to, we're going to have Wall Street pay for it or something. Oh, actually, this is great. Uh, so that is, that is one, one possibility. But how did we go? with education in the United States. What did we, what route did we go for K through 12 education? Who provides it? Public. So one solution we didn't talk about was public provision. Now remember, public provision in this context, maybe I should even just not even call it public provision, I should just call it government provision. <laughs> so that we don't confuse it with public goods. Because is education a public good? Is education a public good? Public goods are non-rival and non-excludable. The answer is no. You're at an institution that's, that's one of them. That's a private company, right? So it's possible to exclude people, blah, 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 right? So it's not a public good, but it's possible for the government to just take it over. We can nationalize education which is exactly what happened in the United States. So this is our current K through 12 system. <laughs> what are some issues with that? Okay, not everybody wants to go to school. Sure. But when we're dealing with K through 12, somebody under the age of 18, or maybe a five-year-old, I don't want to go to school. You know, okay, shut up. You're not old enough to make a decision yourself, presumably. I'm not saying they don't, by the way. And I, I've got some, I've got some, an interesting case on that. But uh, so, um, what else? K through 12. What are some things you guys saw during your K through 12 time frame that might be issues? Dirt. You get taught how to do things. You get taught to the test. Yeah, that that has been one thing. Now, where did that come from? We didn't always do that. Standardized testing, yeah. So, and then <laughs> that still wouldn't necessarily be a big deal, but why would some teachers want to teach to the test or some schools feel like they need to teach to the test? Let me go back to Kayla. Kayla? No Child Left Behind Act, right? So now, in order to get this kid out of here, I need to teach him to the test to, to move him on, to keep him on, because with the No Child Left Behind, there was a penalty if somebody was left behind. Right? You might not get all your funding if you, if you had too many kids left behind. So we started creating that system going in. Well, the school already was the government, though. They can come in and just... By the federal government, yeah. So the schools are actually ran at a local level with federal funding. And so, yeah, it's part of the funding that, that's in place. Kayla? Uh, uh, that's part of the standardized system, yeah. To be accredited, a certain amount of your kids have to be meeting these performance standards, right? And so at least X percent. And so that's where we get into this really black, dark hole of, of well, we got to have certain standards. Oh, I got an idea. Let's make it standardized test, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, we're now teaching to the test. And is that the best thing to do to have students in New Mexico uh, learning the same stuff being taught to a certain test as those people living in Maine or Minnesota or something, right? Not necessarily. There might be things that are better suited. One thing I'm more passionate about is the, is the teachers. I mean, I, I hate to tell you, but I'm not sure you guys had as good a pool of talented teachers that I even had. And 
I'm not that far ahead of you. I'm only 20 years ahead. Or 20 years prior to that, you had some really talented people, very creative people that came up with new things for you to do in the classroom. Can they, do they have as much incentive to do that now? No, it's all very programmatic. You got to do this. I remember a social studies teacher that we all thought was cool. He was probably now looking back, you know, just a pot smoking hippie guy, but he came in and played guitar and sang songs about the revolution or something, you know, that type of stuff. We don't have that type of people. So those people, when they, they're your age now, and I hope I'm not poo-pooing some of you that are education majors, that, that, but most, most of you guys are business majors in here, but, but you get in, you're like, I'm going to teach kids, I love it, and, you know, I can express myself, and I love to see the young mind being older or whatever. And then you get into your first job, and they give you the playbook, and they say, oh, yeah, here it is. Read it up, first class Monday, you know, do it, right? And by the way, your kids have to perform at this level, and here's a copy of the test of what it looks like, and then we're right down that path. That person who's super creative, motivated, did they like it and handed the playbook? No. Right? And so what do they do? They get out. I've met lots of uh, former teachers when I had my real estate license that are realtors. It seems to be a popular thing for educators because I think they can educate, they can use some of their skills that they like dealing with people. They become realtors, apparently, as, as one possible profession. But they go out and do other things. And so now, again, uh, having the government provision of that particular good, we don't have LeBron James in the classroom anymore, right? Because we've put on some restrictions, we may not be getting the, we're stuck with Kyle, no offense again, Kyle, you understand this whole thing, right? We're, we're stuck with Kyle in the classroom, right? So we want to, how do we keep LeBron James in the classroom? Well, one of those things, I, I think, is by having more freedom for the teachers. In addition, there might be pay and other, other issues uh, that they have to look at. All right, so one of the new things that you might have might have heard about that's similar to what we were just doing is vouchers. Are any of you from a state that went to a charter school? Is anybody here from a charter school? Have you guys heard of charter schools? Yeah. Did you have some in your community? Okay, so a charter school is a private school. Now, when I was young, and it's still kind of true today, who went to private schools? The rich kids did, right? The, all the, the rich kids went to the private schools. And so um, a charter school is a little bit different. It's a private school, but um, people are, anybody can come. And how do we get poor kids to the charter school in the public school system? It's instead of saying, you know what, you're going to go to Garfield Elementary because you live on this street you've been assigned this school, here's how the system works. I'm going to give you a voucher. So Makasha, you can go to any school you want. That's a $5,000 credit. We've estimated that that's how much we spend per kid on the public school system is 5,000 bucks. But you don't have to go to Garfield. You can go to any school you want. This is your money, right? This is how you pay for it. And those schools are willing to accept that amount. There's already been agreement in place that they're not going to ding you for, well, that's half the tuition, and now you've got to pay the other half, like OU does, right, with, with some of your scholarships. But that voucher, rather, covers the full price of tuition. So the government gives out these vouchers to people. Now, which school is Makasha going to want to go to or his parents are going to send him to? Which one does he want to go to? The best school, of course, right? Where all of LeBron James are the teachers and the performance are great and they always get to the, to the best colleges and blah, 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 and get the greatest jobs. So are we going to be able to have everybody we give a voucher to go to the LeBron James school? No, there, there's, just, there's a quantity constraint. They only have classrooms of this size. And, and so um, the next step to handling that is similar to what you mentioned was the lottery the lottery system. So now, through a roll of the dice, the whole class is wanting to go to the LeBron school, but it turns out it's just Bo who gets, through a random draw, the voucher to go to that school. Now, do we want a system set up so that Bo can sell that voucher to Makasha? Yes. 
I love your instinct because, yeah, we kind of think, we think yes, but it, we have to remember back to our objective of all this. Our objective was to allow the poor kids to be attending or have equal chances of attending as the rich kids. If we allowed the sale to happen, what would happen? The rich people would pay the poor people, and we'd be right back to where we started with all the, all the rich kids are going to the private good LeBron school. So these are not going to be transferable in this particular context because of the nature of the problem we're trying to solve, right? So we got the vouchers going out to, uh, through a lottery to these schools. All right, so your uh, textbook had some interesting data, um, and I, I've seen some other reports on various things. There's about 4,000 charter schools now in 40 different states. This was definitely an economic driven, economist driven type of thing that was tried. Uh, Milton Friedman was one of the early ones that, uh, one of my favorite economists that, that started to spearhead uh, this. And so it's finally starting to take hold. In Detroit, Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, a good place to live right now? Not so, not so hot. So they allowed the charter system school to go. They have higher performance standards. Uh, for the for the students and 25% lower cost 25% lower cost why why would the cost be why would we start to even maybe expect that cost might be less at a charter school compared to the good old-fashioned public school how does the charter school make money again where's my voucher here. All right, Bo got the voucher. All the kids that come to the charter school pay with these vouchers. So from a revenue perspective, I go turn these into the government, right? Hey, Mr. Government, I got this. I got Bo and I got uh, uh, 300 other kids. They cut me a check for the vouchers, right? So that's my revenue in. So why would costs be expected to be maybe lower? Right, yeah, you have an incentive to reduce costs. If you reduce costs, you make money. You can potentially make money. Now, if it's set up as a non-profit organization, what do, is it illegal for non-profits to earn a profit? No, that's one of the kind of funny things that you go through life and you guys, will, you'll, you'll learn is nonprofit organizations, sometimes more so than ever, need to earn a profit. So what's true about nonprofits is that it's illegal to distribute money to the owners of the organization. So the owners of the nonprofit, whoever they are, are trying to fulfill an education, uh, an education mission. Um, Ottawa University, if we make a million dollars, we're a nonprofit university, so when we make a million dollars, we need to make a million. Where does that money go? Russ's pocket, I wish. But I will tell you, some of it might be able to go into Russ's pocket. If, Ru if, if they value my contribution here, and I say, I just got an offer from another school, they're willing to pay me $10,000 more, does Ottawa now have the means to meet the market demands? to keep me around, assuming they want me around. Yeah, so it might go partially into my pocket, right? Where else does it go for, in real sense here, when Ottawa University makes a profit, that money, does it just sit there and collect dust, or what, what do we have the opportunity to do? Goes into buildings, good, so we got new buildings, new technology, right? New stuff, things that enhance education long-term, now that gives us capital expenditures, we can maybe restrike the parking lot that's been needing it for, for years or whatever. So profits are important to nonprofit organizations, and those things end up getting rolled in, which then ultimately trickle down to the customer, likely. You guys get a better experience, better facilities, better technology, better Wi-Fi, you know, whatever. That stuff gets rolled. So you guys really have incentive to want to see this place profitable, too, in that sense, anyway. Yeah. Um, for the whole nonprofit thing, money can't be given to the owners of the nonprofit organization. 
can they give that to a another party and then <clears throat> take the money from that other party? Yeah, they can engage in contracts. And I mean, if you're getting into deception and fraud, there's cases of that. So if they set up a, a shell company that says, hey, I'm providing a education consultation to OU. Okay, great. Well, here's a $500,000 contract. I give you 500000 and you come to school one day and say, yeah, you're doing good here. Looks good. See you later. Right? That's your consulting and you got paid 500,000. So yeah, th it's subject to potential fraud that then is then monitored by either other stakeholders or potentially the government because they are getting a tax-free status on that. So there is a policing effort with nonprofits as well. But in general, nonprofits have been pretty good breeding grounds for, for fraud over the years, just as a side note. So it is possible for that which means you as a donor to that particular charity, um, you know, should try to be aware of that through research that usually kind of like consumer reports, you can check out charities and how they're doing it. Does their money go to where they say that it's going to go and so forth? Or does the, the CEO of the nonprofit have a big fat paycheck? I think the owner of uh, goodwill rakes in a million and a half or $2 million is the paycheck to the CEO of goodwill. So for instance, is one example. So, but the argument is, is Goodwill a pretty successful chain? Does it help the poor? You know, is that CEO talented in what they do? Is society better off if that CEO has turned down offers of five million? Well, some changes your tune on it a little bit, right? Should, should the, if, if the CEO is actually taking a cut in pay to work for Goodwill when they could be turning down alternatives at other for-profit companies, and it's not so bad. So we got that's where we got to use our economic way of thinking to, to think through those issues. All right, so vouchers. Let's write down a few notes here for that. Um, let's see if I have any notes here. Basically what we talked about. Oh, I was going to say, I forgot to, uh, food stamps are essentially a voucher that you might be familiar with. Food stamps are a voucher system. You've been determined to be poor. I'm going to give you 20 bucks to go buy food. You get a little card, the voucher. You go run to the store, and that is accepted at a lot of different types of places. Certainly Walmart's one of them. You run your little food stamp card through the machine, just like a debit card, and you buy your food. The government provided that through uh, a voucher system. And so um, another example is charter schools. There are 4,000 uh, charter schools in 40 states. And what it is, is essentially a private school that is allowed to accept um, vouchers as payment for education. You know, it's allowed to accept and kind of only accepts just to, so that we don't confuse. It doesn't mean all private schools don't have to accept vouchers, right? You're kind of getting into a government program here <coughs> with this voucher system. So government issues, government issues, permit, or I'm sorry, not permit, let's use the word voucher. Government issues voucher to every school age kid. <clears throat> and 
and then he or she chooses where to go. If good school is maxed out or is at capacity, then a lottery is used. Parentheses, but not transferable. Now, who do you think was against charter schools when they were first being talked about? There was a big battle in some states. Private schools? No, they didn't mind because they still had their they still had their thing. But most public schools, yeah, public school administrators, they're like, oh, those charter schools, they won't be able to provide a proper type of education, you know, we're the only ones who can do it, because they're worried about job protection, right, and protecting their own budgets, because guess what? If students start flocking to the charter school, what happens to the budget at the existing public school? It goes down. So we talked about how they were more budget-oriented, always asking for more money. I can make these kids smarter. I just need another million dollars, right? That has turned out to not be very successful, that you can throw money at problems. That's kind of true in life just about everywhere. You gotta put in a little more care than just throwing money at the problems. Everybody will always jump to the argument of, if we just had more funding, we could make it happen, right? That's a common response. Um, and so the charter schools, when they had that response, kind of have an interesting proposition. They're like, hey, we're willing to open up a school. You just give us the budget divided by the number of students. You're paying it anyway, right? We can do better. Give them a choice. Give them some school choice. And it's been, uh, it's been pretty, pretty successful overall. The overall analysis um, is that uh, charter schools outperform public schools. So the key point is that we have competition. We introduce competition to public schools. Nothing like a little healthy competition to bring out the best in people. Now the public schools are like, oh crap, man, we better, maybe we ought to go out and find ourselves a LeBron James or something or do something different with the curriculum or whatever, right? All of a sudden you're like, geez, these charter schools, this is a real thing. We, we better we better get on our A game now when we have um, when we have some competition. So the uh, Detroit example, there was higher performance. Students did better on standardized testing. Blah blah blah. Higher performance and 25 percent lower cost. That would what we call in economics, big fancy term here, a no-brainer, right? Students are outperforming at a lower cost. Pretty impressive result. Not certainly not the case everywhere, uh, but on average, uh, they're seeing these types of results with the with the charter school system. All right. Any questions or comments on that one? All right, one last topic for chapter 17. <clears throat> that won't take too long. <clears throat> there was a famous economist named Ronald Coase. And in the 1950s, he approached the problem of 
a tragedy of commons in kind of a creative way at the time <clears throat> and develop what has now become the Coase theorem. The Coase theorem. So 1950s, uh, Ron Coase. And here's one of the examples that he that he used. Suppose we got a piece of land, and we've got two farmers. One's a rancher, and one's a one's a rancher who raises cattle. Oops, that looks more like a horse. So we got a rancher who has cattle, and then we've got a farmer who raises corn, right? So we got the land is all filled, and this is where they do business here. Well, over time, there was this area of land that was kind of just sitting there. And so the farmer started slowly but surely each year, not even necessarily completely on purpose, but the corn, nobody seemed to bother, and he slowly but surely started doing that and planting some corn on it. And the rancher saw the same thing, <laughs> that this land wasn't owned by every, anybody, and everybody knew it, and so he would let his cattle come in here. And so ultimately what would happen each year is that the farmer would plant corn on the unowned land and the rancher would allow the cattle to roam the unowned land. The cattle would trample part of the corn and cause damage to it, but didn't damage at all. And since the farmer didn't have to pay for the land, he still was able to uh, be to the good by using up the free land, right? So we've got this land sitting unowned, and we have both the production of cattle and uh, corn going on on the land, and then there's this trample cost. So farmer and rancher use the free land. Farmer has trampled costs. So from society's use of resources, we kind of say, well, that's kind of a waste, you know, to have, have this corn getting wasted. The farmer went through the whole process, buying the seed and, and doing it, and then we've got cattle going in and using it, causing this, this waste. And so is there a solution to eliminate the waste? What are some things that might be able to be done to eliminate the trample cost? Property rights, good. So how how would you do it? What would you do, Keith? 50-50, okay. So if the government just came in and said, all right, we've made a search for the owner. This land's just been abandoned for 100 years. Who knows? Lord knows who. And by the way, this happens in real life that people don't know who owns the land and they've tried to find it. Um, being in the real estate business, I learned of weird stories like that. It's like, well, there's this kind of this extra piece that I don't know who owns it. So not an unusual story. The government could come in and say, okay, let's just do 50-50. And, of course, the 50-50 story would be that there would be this much corn and potentially this much cattle, right? So that seems to be kind of the fair thing to do. But... As much as economists uh, care about fairness, which sometimes they don't, they might be lacking in that, we care about efficiency. So from society's standpoint, 
are we getting the right amount of corn and the right amount of cattle? Or by doing this, are we kind of through the, the hand of government, if you will, uh, having too much corn or too much cattle? Or is, is a 50-50 split the right split, right? Because maybe we're at a point in time where corn is more valuable, then we should maybe have more corn. Oops, maybe we should have just given all the, maybe we should have given all the land to the farmer. Or maybe meat is scarce and we should have given all the land to the rancher. My point with that is that how does government know what the best solution is? They don't, that's right. They, they absolutely don't. And, and possibly what's, what's right today may not be right tomorrow, right? So what works for 2015 might look differently in 2020. Okay, so bear with me for a second. Let's suppose that we, that we give all of the land to the farmer. Is it ever possible that we would get more cattle going? If the farmer owns all of the land, meat prices are skyrocketing, it's like the, the, the rancher can't make enough cows and get, get the meat to the market. Or, if, so let's say the farmer owns the whole thing, if corn's down and the farmer says, well, I'll give you like X amount, which is under like what he's going to produce with the cattle that are going on there, then it might be more profitable for both for the farmer to rent the land to the cattle. Okay, so the it's possible then that because cattle prices are high, the rancher can give the farmer an offer he can't refuse. What is that offer? An offer that's bigger than what he's going to make doing it with corn, right? And so then we'd have a rental agreement, which would at least be the trample cost. So the payment between the two would be at least the trample cost in that case. If we gave all of the land to the rancher, the rancher has the same incentives now that corn prices are going crazy. The farmer is able to make an offer to the rancher, cattle prices are down, farm prices are up, to rent the land back from the rancher. They'll make more money off corn because corn prices are high. Now, when they go swapping, and maybe over the course of 50 years, the land's been rented back and forth 10, 20 times. Was the government involved with all of those switches, all of those choices? No. What was the key thing we needed in order to? We needed property rights, right? The whole problem came down to nobody owned the land. So, what Coase brought to the table in the 1950s was kind of big because at that time government was getting big. We came out of the Great Depression and government solutions seemed to be the norm. Maybe the government needs to own this land. Yeah, we'll just take this over and we'll become the rancher or the farmer right there. So big government was kind of on the rise at this time and Coase's contribution got him the Nobel Prize in economics, which we didn't talk about that uh, earlier. Agnes Deaton uh, is an economist that won it this year, just last week that was announced. Um, but Ronald Coase won the Nobel Prize from this concept. Doesn't this almost seem dumb? Like, we could have figured this out, right? Again, beautiful mind type of stuff. Sometimes the simple solutions are just right in front of you, but you got to think through them. And so assigning property rights is another solution to the externality that doesn't involve the subsidy, it doesn't involve the in individual transferable quota, the voucher system, right? All the solutions that we talked about kept government in the picture. Government is out of the picture once the property rights are assigned. If we do it the 50-50 way, which might seem very fair, right? Maybe we do do it 50-50, we still get the result of they can rent the land one way or the other, right? So no matter what the allocation of the land is, we're going to get the best solution if we assign property rights. And of course, um, almost implicitly, once you own it, we take it for granted in the United States, but we have the right to transfer those rights, right? To sell it through a rental agreement or to lease it, sell it or lease it. All right, so farmer has trample costs. Um, 
Here's the Coase theorem. The Coase theorem. Um, if we have a lack of property rights, there are three conditions, three conditions that must hold to allow free markets to get an optimal solution. Our optimal solution would be the allocatively efficient solution that we've been talking about. Three conditions. First one, well-defined property rights. Well-defined property rights. Number two, if there is a small number of agents. In this case, we had a farmer and a rancher. A small number of people. And lastly, low bargaining costs or transaction costs. Low bargaining slash transaction costs. Well-defined property rights, a small number of agents, and low bargaining transaction costs. So in our example here, we've got two neighbors, two good old boys, and the bargaining cost is them meeting at the fence line and say, hey, Jim, I'll give you 46 bucks uh, for, per acre on, on that land. What do you say, right? So we got low bargaining costs, a small number of agents, well-defined property rights. If we have that, then the market system through high corn prices or low, uh, low meat prices or vice versa, the market system will entice these two profit maximizers to negotiate out the right amount of corn and beef um, according to the current marketplace. And this is pretty powerful because again, at the time, government was getting big and it was more looking at government solutions, whereas this now defines a private solution through markets that will maybe resolve these issues. Does the Coase theorem work for something like pollution? So when we have an externality like pollution, we, no. the economist in me wants to always say, well, wait a second. Uh, do we need the government to, to meddle with this, or, or can the market figure it out? So you say no, and why? Uh, this, is a, this, is, this is one of the potential solutions with the pollution externality. I agree with you, by the way, that the answer is no, but now I want to come back to coast. The reason this is kind of powerful is to say, why wouldn't it work with pollution? It's kind of hard to define property rights. Uh, property rights might be hard to define, but impossible. Well, we we kind of did it with the with the uh, with the permits that I that I went through late last time, Sam. There are large number of agents. Yeah, a large number of agents. So it kind of violates number two that if we're polluting the world and it's global warming, it might even be agents that aren't born yet, right? So we kind of violate number two with pollution, and therefore we first turn to coast and say, hey. Did, Will a market work on its own if we if we have property rights? Is, is a lack of property rights the, the issue? Um, can we define the property rights with the pollution? We came up with some ways to define the property rights, but the number of agents didn't work. It was, there wasn't able to be this negotiation, and so we might need to turn to government for some sort of solution. One of those solutions might be better than the others, and that's what we brought to the table with the ITQs and the, and the cap and trade concepts, where there's still a a market mechanism at work rather than just completely the heavy hand of government saying you can only do this or I'm going to tax you this, right? Jared? You said the external cost, you can't really measure it very precisely. Yeah. So 
Would, well, it's difficult in, in could, some cases. We could figure out a bargaining cost. Oh, for here? Or you mean with, the, with this example? Oh, you're talking about here. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, so, so that the bargaining cost might not be, well, it might be related to the number of agents, but to actually have the permits um, tradable might not be, might not be the problem. The, the, the transaction cost might be low, but the number of agents is too big to efficiently get it the trade off of I'm polluting the atmosphere, so I'm going to pay all the people that are getting harmed by it. Can't do it, right? Because the number of agents that are getting harmed are, are is too big. Okay. So that wraps up 17. And then we'll spend Friday on our last chapter, resources. Yes. Mm -hmm.